news for the Bonanza Creek LTER. We had our site review in June of 2019, and that prompted a lot of introspection and some circumspection, and we've been working on a strategic plan as a result of that. We've been working on that over the past year. And one of the things that's been most exciting about this for me is that we've been developing some all hands synthesis activities. And it's been exciting to see these activities get traction. Um, another little piece of news, we have a network office science communication fellow, Haley Dunlevy. She's a PhD student in my lab at Northern Arizona and she spent the spring doing some virtual road trips between Fairbanks and the Bonanza Creek LTR and the Arctic LTR on the North Slope. All right, so the first thing I wanted to share with you today, um, I wanted to highlight some of the educational activities that are going on at Bonanza Creek, because I think this is really emerging as one of the great strengths of our program. The program I want to tell you about today is called Fostering Science, and if you can read the text around that icon, enlisting the power of nature and the passion of scientists to empower youth in the care system. So this is a program for foster care youth, and it's directed by Krista Mulder and by Katie Spellman. And, you know, it's just been immensely popular. They've run it for two full years. And then this year, I think we're going to have to put it on hold until next summer. But kids want to come back each year. Um, they've generated a really connected community of learners. And in these tumultuous lives that many of these foster care kids live, it's creating this little center of um, connection for them. So I think this is a unique and really special program that Krista and Katie have been working on. All right, well, let's jump into the science. So we all know the Arctic region, the permafrost soils region is warming faster than any other place on earth. We know that in Fairbanks, the area of the Bonanza Creek LTER, temperature has been increasing since the mid 1900s. And by last year, it was about two and a half degrees warmer than the long-term average. So this is driving change in ecosystem state factors, climate, but it's also driving changes in the soil processes that underlie all ecosystem functions in this system. And here I'm showing you a graph from Vladimir Romanovsky. He's modeled mean annual soil temperature from 1930 to the present. And you can see that mean annual soil temperature, even at 50 centimeters deep in the soil, um, is above zero. So this is a novel state for mean annual temperature in this record. All right, so we know that the warming of these cold, in many cases, permafrost soils has both local and global consequences, and we've talked about that in these past um, Science Council blurbs. The thawing of frozen ground is creating new connections between old soil organic matter and contemporary carbon balance, and we think, in general, it's driving net positive emissions of carbon dioxide and methane that have impacts on the climate system. But there are a lot of other things that are going on as these soils warm. Hydrology of the landscape is being replumbed. There are new connections between uplands and lowlands, between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Surfaces are drying, exacerbating drought for some forested areas. And then drier soils are leading to more intense and deeply burning fires. We know that new geomorphology is em emerging through mass wasting events that move soils and sediments. And then finally, we know that there are new challenges for the people who live in or build on these landscapes. So to focus in on the challenge and sort of the exciting things that we're looking forward to, I want to focus in on something called italic. So this is a Russian word for layers of ground that remain unfrozen throughout the winter. They're above the permafrost and below the surface that freezes. So it's a warm soil sandwiched between a frozen top and bottom. And here I'm showing you this Bonanza Creek soil temperature profile. And if we just pull out the last few years, you can see that the 50 centimeter depth temperature trace is not freezing in the winter, even though the soil is frozen above and below. And there's free water in this unfrozen layer. And Vladimir thinks that this is indeed the first time that this has happened 
happened in this area probably since the Little Ice Age. All right, so here's our challenge. We've got taliks as the emergence of a new soil habitat. How is this gonna impact the dynamics in an ecosystem where below ground resources are paramount to all of the carbon and nutrient cycling processes? We think that these taliks are creating new niches, new phenologies, unfrozen in summer, unfrozen in winter. They're creating hot spots and hot moments for the cycling of carbon. And our challenge is really to figure out, well, what are they doing down there in the winter in these unfrozen layers. It's really hard to access. Um, I'm just gonna show you two brief things. One is a cover from cover art from a work by Becky Hewitt, who's a postdoc in my lab in collaboration with Lee Taylor at the University of New Mexico and Helene Genet at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where we've been using nitrogen isotopes and then fungal genomics to link plant nutrition to unthawed layers. You can see how the ericoid mycorrhizae is turning the crank to mine the rich permafrost nitrogen that's being exposed by thaw. And we're also working on new techniques that combine isotopes and genomics to link microbial identity and microbial activity. So for instance, we're using quantitative stable isotope probing to determine who is active over time, and then to link that activity to ecosystem processes such as decomposition and nitrogen transformations. All right, thank you for listening.